So this hadith that we are doing tonight is taken from uh, a collection by Imam al-Nawawi, who was a very famous uh, scholar specializing in hadith. And he compiled a book called Forte Hadith, which became very famous and very popular. And we had mentioned before these collections of Forte was because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the people who memorize Forte Hadith or practice it, they will raise up on Yawm al close to him like this two index fingers. Uh, this hadith <clears throat> uh, is, is a series of instructions that the Prophet ﷺ has given to us. Now, as a quick recap, uh, what is hadith? Um, it's important to remember that the word hadith actually means something new or recent. And the, the hadith refers to the, the recording of the sayings, actions, and approvals of the Prophet You should also know that there is a, a, a new group of people. They have been around for a while, but they, it's important to know that they exist. We are now referring to them as Quranists. And these are Muslims or supposed Muslims who reject hadith and they feel that the Quran is the only thing we need to follow and that we don't have to follow the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, and that the Quran is complete as a book to give us guidance and so we have this group of people who um, try to tell us that we, we are not obligated to follow anything of the Prophet وسلم, or any of the hadith of the Prophet وسلم. That we are only following Quran. Um, their position is really untenable, but they do try very hard to justify it and to try to bring arguments for it. And so, in your dealings with people, you may put up with one of these people who feels that you know we only need to follow the Quran. Um, of course, that leads to a lot of issues. They don't. They have a different way how they pray. The Quran doesn't describe the prayer, the Quran doesn't describe the months of Hajj, the Quran doesn't describe so many things, and so they find themselves trying to um, create a, a way of life from the Quran alone, and it becomes very untenable. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so this hadith contains many, many things. Uh, it's a fairly long hadith. And so it, it contains virtues, it contains principles, it contains sciences, it contains rulings, it contains manners. So there are many, many things that is contained within this hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that we can benefit from. It also kind of indicated, it's connected to the last hadith of 35th hadith which we did, in which it talks about the rules of brotherhood and relationship. It kind of continues on that theme uh from this hadith so the scholars have linked the two hadith and said the one that one and this one are very closely um, connected and the hadith's general theme is that when you do anything good anything of of, of benefit to others allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow it to go unanswered but allah will in return make sure something good happens to you as well that allah will protect your good even if you do an atom's weight of good, Allah will preserve it and you will see it. But Allah will also reward you. So whenever you do anything good to anyone else, Allah notes it and he also brings more good to you. And so this hadith, uh, we will go through it piece by piece. I will quickly read the, the, the hadith itself and then we will take it line by line inshallah an abi huraira radiyallahu an 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 nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal man nafasa an mu'minin qurbatan min qurb al-dunya nafasahu allah nafasa allah anhu qurbatan min qurb al-yawm al-qiyama wa man yassara ala mu'sir yassara allah alayhi fi al-dunya wal-akhirah wa man satara musliman satarahu allah fi al-dunya wal-akhirah Wallahu fi awn al abd, ma kan al abdu fi awn yahi. Woman salaka tarikan yal tamisu fihi ilma, sahalallahu lahu bihi tarikan il aljan. Womach tamaa kaumun fi baitin min beutilla, yet luna kitab Allah. Wait a dara sunahu bain hum illa nazalat alayhim us sakina. Wa rashiat humur rahma, wa hafat humul malaika. 
wa zakarahum Allahu fi man 'indah wa man abta'a bihi 'amaluhu lam yusra' bihi nasabu so as we mentioned it's a very long hadith it's recorded rawahu muslim and the meaning of it is on the tarif of huraira radiyallahu an said that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever removes a worldly grief from a believer allah will remove from him one of the grievances of the day of judgment whoever alleviates the needs of a needy person allah will alleviate his need in this world and the next whoever conceals the fault of a muslim allah will conceal his faults in this world and the next Allah will aid a servant of his so long as a servant aids his brother. Whoever follows a path to seek knowledge therein, Allah will make easy for him a path to paradise. No people gather together in one of the houses of Allah, reciting the book of Allah and studying it among themselves, except tranquility de descends upon them, mercy envelops them, and the angels surround them. And Allah makes mention of them among those who are with him. Whoever is slowed down by his actions will not be hastened forward by his lineage. <clears throat> so as we can see, this hadith covers many, many different things. And so we will break it out piece by piece and try to get a, a, at least a, a clear understanding of the hadith itself. And then hopefully we'll be able to have time at the end to ask questions as well. من نفس عن مؤمن قربة من قربة نفسه نفس الله عنه قربة قربة يوم القيامة. So the first poor hadith: Whoever removes a worldly grief from a believer, Allah will remove from him one of the grievances of the day of judgment. And so the word نفس gives the idea. Sometimes there's two things: relieve and remove. So relieve means you are easing the condition of the person, but you have not really uh, solved the problem completely with them. Whereas nafasa more gives the idea of trying to completely remove that grief, that grief that they may have within them, that you are able to help them to remove that grief completely. And so the first lesson we are learning from this is that Whenever a believer has any problems, it is the responsibility of the fellow believers to try to help. We are one ummah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us in namal mukminuna ikhwa, that we are brothers. That if you see some fellow believer hurting, or in fear, or grief, we're not allowed to just say, well, that's their problem. That's not my business. As long as a believer is in distress, it automatically become the business of fellow believers to try to help wherever they can. And so, firstly, we are told that we must try to do that. And if you do that, Allah says, I will give, make it an incentive for you. I will, I will allow an opportunity for you <clears throat> to have one of the grievances or one of the grief that you will go through on the day of judgment to be removed from you. And we would prefer Allah to do that on Yom al because it has more value there than for Allah to say, I'm just going to remove a grievance of you in this world. <clears throat> we would prefer Allah postpone it and remove it from that moment when we will be standing before him and we will have no helper, no shade, and we will badly in need of every kind of help that we can get on that day. And so Allah says that he will um, do that and so in this way Allah is kind of telling us that I'm going to do more for you you relieve the, the grief of a person in this dunya I'm going to relieve I'm going to do more I'm not only going to relieve grief from you I will make very sad is because of lack of knowledge of their situation or of their condition and so you can provide knowledge as a way of relieving grief you can provide wealth as a way of relieving grief you can provide authority by giving them some position uh, to make their situation better. And you could also provide other kinds of help. So the idea is that when you approach the believer with whatever is 
bothering them, causing them to grief, that you are able to provide grief to the extent that it helps to resolve that. So the Prophet ﷺ begins by asking us, and he didn't command us to do it in this way, but he's expressing it in a way that if you do so, then here is what is going to happen to you. In other words, if you help this person, here is what. So he's leaving an option for us. You don't want to help, then you deprive yourself of this reward. <clears throat> and after talking about grief, which is a, a mental thing, which is something that is going on inside of them, now he talks about another kind of uh, problem in which the person have a financial or an, is a needy person. Woman yassara ala mu'sir yassara allahu alayhi fi dunya wa la Whoever alleviates the needs of a needy person. Allah will alleviate his needs in this world and the next. Now the reward is even more. That if you see a needy person and you are able to help them to alleviate that need, then Allah says he will take care of your need both here and in the hereafter. So there's a double reward here. And this is usually referred to as um, someone in debt. Part of the... The way we can alleviate someone who is in need. Like if someone owes you money, then you're obligated if that person can't pay you in time. You are obligated to try and give that person more time. Give them extra time. وَإِن كَانَ ذُو أُسْرَةٍ فَنَظِرَةٌ إِلَى مَيْسَرَةٌ وَأَن تَصَدَّقُوا خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلِمُونَ And if the debtor is in straightened circumstances, let him have respite until the time of ease. In other words, give them more time to pay. Don't tack on more interests or, or make their life even more difficult and try to capitalize on their hardship and difficulty and weakness. We are asked by Allah to give them time. And whatever you remit by way of charity is better for you. And if you are able to, like, don't even ask for the money again since you know their condition is so bad. So one of the ways of... Helping a person in need is to give them extra time. Another way is to just drop the debt, just reduce the debt, you know, because you recognize that they are unable to pay. And so as an act of kindness and mercy, you tell them, look, you know, you don't have to pay all of it. You know, I will reduce it by half. If you have the capacity to do that, then that is a noble thing to do in terms of someone who is needy, that we... <clears throat> We, we drop the debt, you know. And another way of doing that is also for someone to assist them by actually paying the debt for them. So you see a needy person, they're unable to pay their debt, but you will step forward and says, I will take care of it for you. You know, like sometimes when we have, especially when someone passes away, they can't afford a funeral, you know, they can't afford the, the cost of burial. You know, you have conscientious Muslims and the Muslim community, they, they step forward and they finance the, the burial cost <clears throat> for that person. So here the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us that we have to be conscious of people around us who might be needy. Now, a lot of times needy people don't come and ask for help because they have dignity. You actually have to seek them out. You have to know who are the poor people and you have to keep them and remember them and keep asking them how they're doing. Because, you know, sometimes we just forget them. We just ignore them. You know, Hassan al-Basri said, a beggar came, you know, I quoted this story already. I knocked on his door asking for help and he started to cry. And the beggar felt embarrassed and says, oh, no, no, I didn't want to cause you any trouble. He says, no, I'm embarrassed that you had to come to me. You know, I'm crying because... I should have come to you and not allow you the indignity of having to step out and come and knock on my door. You know, and so I am embarrassed and I'm ashamed and I'm saddened that I had to allow you to do this. And so in any community, in any place, we have to remember, we have to know who our poor relatives are, who our needy people are in our community. We should always have a list of them and we should constantly check in on them and try to find ways of helping them <clears throat> to be able to alleviate their needs. 
And then the Prophet ﷺ continues now and talks about a different thing. First, mental helping someone with grief. Second, he talks about helping someone in need who is finding. Now he's talking about protecting the, the reputation of the person. See, first dealing with their angst and, and, and psychological and, and grief, then dealing with their physical needs. Now he's talking about protecting their dignity and their reputation. Woman satara Musliman Satarahullahu fi dunya wal akhirah. And whoever conceals the faults of a Muslim. Allah will conceal his fault in this world and the next. And the Prophet ﷺ said, O oh, you who believe, O oh, you who have believed with your tongues and iman is yet to enter your hearts, don't backbite Muslims and do not search for their faults. For whoever searches for their faults, Allah will search for their faults. And whoever Allah searches for their faults will be exposed, even in his house. Other, that we should go and try to expose the fault of another and he warns us that Allah will expose our faults if we do that even if we are in the house of Allah Allah will expose our faults and Allah can expose the faults of anyone at any time and if Allah was to expose our faults to others what an embarrassing because Allah knows all the things we do secretly Humanity do not. You know, a lot of humanity see the outward part of us. They don't know what is going on in our houses and our hearts. And so they praise us and they compliment us, but they don't know. We know how much we sin. We know individually in our hearts how much we're not doing. And so if Allah exposes that, you know, there was that incident where there was a lady in a coma and one of the male nurse, you know, he used to abuse her in the hospital because she was in a coma and he felt he would never get caught. There's no cameras there. You know, no one would know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed him. He caused this lady with coma to get pregnant. And then they had to do DNA and they caught him. So when Allah wants to expose your fault, there's no way that you could hide. But Allah is a mercy. Do not do this. So we are not allowed to go, especially now with Facebook and everybody trying to out somebody and, you know, what do they call it? I think cancel culture. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't keep up with some of the terminologies. Uh, we should not do that as Muslims. <clears throat> the believers are the ones, whenever we see something in a believer, we should make excuse for them. Because hypocrites, all they do is they find faults. They find faults with everybody. You know, the believers, they make an excuse. They see a believer have a, a shortcoming, they make an excuse on their behalf. You know, they don't look to just expose them. And really, the believer should be primarily concerned with your own faults. You know, you should be worried about the things which you are not doing well and not spend your time watching and looking at others, you know, that we don't spy on other people and, and keep uh, doing that. So the Prophet ﷺ said, if you conceal the fault of a Muslim, Allah will conceal your faults in this world and the next. Where there are some things that you can ask from Allah that their sins will not even be shown on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Because he said that, وَأَدْبِعِ السَّيَّةَ الْحَسِنَةَ تَمْهُوهَا that when you follow up a good deed with a bad one, Allah will erase your sin to the extent that it will not even be show up on the record. That's how much Allah can do for us. And so, some of the, the, the early scholars, they used to say, I met the people who had no apparent fault. 
but they mentioned the faults of others, so then their faults got exposed. See, a matter of people, they look like they have no fault in them, but the moment they open their mouth and they begin to comment, they begin to speak about the faults of others, and that became their fault. And I met others who have many faults, but one of it was not to speak about the faults of others. And so people forgot their faults and overlooked it because they behaved in that way. Actually, you know, when you, you, <clears throat> when, when a, belie a believer should actually be sad when you see others' faults, but this is a sign of a man. Because hypocrites, when they see the believer's faults, they become happy. They're glad that this person is like that so that they could expose them. You know, whereas to the believer, they feel sad and they try to cover up their faults. Now, when it comes to exposing the sins, there are certain rules which, if you have, we shouldn't mention the faults of the righteous people. If you have a righteous person in a community who does not commit sin openly and who is known as a righteous person, and then they commit a sin, we should try to not expose that sin. But if you have a sinful person who constantly does sin publicly, privately, then you are allowed to warn the Muslims about this person in a way not to mock them, but to alert the Muslim about the dangers of the sins that they commit so that they can protect themselves. Whoever conceals the faults of a Muslim, Allah will conceal his fault in this world and the next, as the Prophet ﷺ keeps saying. Now, <clears throat> Ibn Rajab says that people can fall into two categories. Um, those who are not known for transgression or committing bad deeds. So whenever, as I mentioned, if they do a mistake or they commit a bad deed, then you should conceal it. Those who are transgressing all the time, we need to let the Muslim community know. So this is the second instruction. Now, one of the ways in which what happens is that we, we mention the faults of people because we make jokes. We make fun of people sometimes. You know, we see somebody uh, does something that becomes funny to us and we begin to ridicule them. You know, we should refrain from doing that. There's a long ayah in Surah Al-Hujurat, in which Allah says, you should not mock or make fun of a fellow believer, man and woman. <clears throat> and so, as we try to make jokes of other people's um, mistakes, because to us, they make a mistake or they may not have knowledge about something and they act in a very strange way, and we see it's funny to us. You know, we should try to protect ourselves from behaving like that because none of us are perfect, right? And most importantly, if you see a scholar, a learned person of Islam, you know, um, and you may come to the conclusion that this ulama or this scholar, this alim uh, has done something or is behaving in a strange way or is doing something, you know, that you think is wrong, we also have to show very great respect and not just jump out and try to make conclusions. Because with people of knowledge, a lot of times they will do something that we don't understand the wisdom of it. But not knowledgeable people always have a rationale. They have a philosophy. They have a re reason why they do what they do. And a lot of times they have an evidence to support what they do. So when you see a learned person do something, before you jump to conclusion, you should always either approach them or other scholars to understand the matter better before we do that. Because scholars are in a constant mode of new research and, and bringing new ideas. And so sometimes they will bring an idea. I remember when Dr. Tariq Ramadan brought some ideas up to, the, to their ulema in the Muslim scholarship, they were like shocked. But he met with like 40 scholars and says, let me, let me defend my position. Met with them and, and advocated his position. So sometimes you may hear a scholar say something which you have never heard of before. You've got to be careful not to jump to conclusion. 
And then the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, Wallahu fi awn al abd ma kan al abdu fi awn akhi. That Allah will continue to help a servant of His so long as His servant helps His brother. Now, notice this kind of help from Mullah now is a conditional help. That Allah says, as long as you continue to help others, I will continue to help you. And that is why you find when you're a generous, helpful person, Allah takes care of you. Because Allah will come to your aid. Allah will be with you. Allah will make sure that you're okay. So Allah will make it easy for you in the dunya and the akhirah because you are helping others. And for those people who do this, you can see the benefit, literally. You know, I see... Like you have a lot of the Muslims sometimes when they are very generous in the masjid, people support their businesses. And you see they get back much more than they give. Allah always find a way to bring that back to you. Loving your brother for what you love for yourself, Allah will bring Allah to help you. And so we need to, not only our brother, anyone in need, anyone in need that you see, that you can help, as long as you continue to help people, Allah will continue to help you. And then Allah now moves the conversation after talking about these different rights to our brothers. Now talks about you and talks about us in terms of how do we help ourselves. In other words, how do we help ourselves? Now we have helped our brother and we have learned the rules of helping our brothers. Now we move the conversation to how can you help yourself as a believer? وَمَنْ سَلَقَ تَرِيكًا يَلْتَمِسُوا فِيهِ عِلْمَ سَحَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ تَرِيكًا إِلَى جَنَّةً Whoever follows a path to seek knowledge therein, Allah will make easy for him a path to paradise. What a beautiful saying, an incentive to learn, to seek knowledge. See, when you seek knowledge, there's certain intention you need to have firstly. Number one, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek knowledge so that we could learn how to please Allah. We seek knowledge so that we can find out the information and the rulings that we are required from us that will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to just satisfy our intellectual cravings and desire. We don't just go looking for knowledge as an academic exercise. We're looking to learn what we need to do to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, when we seek knowledge, is to remove ignorance from ourselves. Because the more we know, the more good deeds we are able to do, the more we are able to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek knowledge to defend the sharia, so that when others attack the sharia, when people don't understand the sharia, we have knowledge to be able to explain our deen, to understand it ourselves, and to be able to advocate it as the way of life. For humanity, we seek knowledge to reform our character and our action and to act upon our knowledge. The most critical thing about knowledge is to act upon knowledge. So, <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that whoever follows a path to seek knowledge, Allah will now make his path, the Jannah, easy for him. And isn't that what we all want? What greater incentive can you have for seeking knowledge? And Allah says, I will make sure the path to Jannah becomes easier for you. And this is said figuratively and literally as well. And making the path easy, number one, Allah says, by, I mean, the, the implications of this saying is making your path to knowledge easily so you will be guided to Jannah. Because the more you know, the easier it will be, easier it will be to deal with shaitan, the easier it will be to know what is right and what is wrong, how to enjoin right, forbid wrong. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by giving us knowledge, automatically we become more qualified to get the Jannah. Making it easy for us to benefit from the knowledge. There are a lot of people with knowledge, but they don't benefit from it. In fact, some people, they become arrogant. Some people, they become disobedient as a result of their knowledge. 
the same Quranists that I mentioned before, who reject Hadith and reject Sunnah. They think they know so much that they end up, their knowledge that they acquire, end up causing them to deviate from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will make us be more prepared and easy to pass the, the Sirat, the bridge over the hellfire. And will make the knowledge cause us to live a life of happiness and constructiveness and ambition. Now, one of the caveat of knowledge is that you have to act upon knowledge. Knowledge is one of those things. If you don't act on it, then it will leave you. So the some of the scholars says knowledge called upon actions. If it actions answered, if, it, if that action answered, then knowledge will remain. In other words, if you take, use that knowledge that you have, then that knowledge will remain with you. But if you didn't use it, you didn't act upon it, it will leave you. You will forget it because you're not living it. You're not embodying it. So whoever acts what he knows, Allah will teach him more things he didn't know. And all of us know that. That when you have some knowledge, just simply act of teaching that knowledge increases your knowledge as well. So when you act on the knowledge by sharing it with others, by applying it to your life, Allah will give you more. Allah will now cause your knowledge to become even more and vast. And knowledge, one of the things about knowledge is that you have to struggle to acquire it. <clears throat> you know, it doesn't come easy. Anybody who have tried You will only gain that amount of knowledge that you struggled for. You can't just take a tablet and drink it and expect that you will get knowledge. You know, Allah has made it in such a way that you have to work for it. And as much as you work, that much Allah will give you. Ibn Rajab again classifies knowledge into two, two types. There's a type of knowledge that when you get the knowledge, moves your heart you know it 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 this it causes something inside of you that when they are reminded of the ayats of Allah their hearts tremble that something happens to the heart when knowledge of Allah comes to you and it helps them to glorify Allah to love him more so one of the results or outcome of knowledge is it makes you that better a believer in which your heart becomes moved with faith and you glorify and love Allah more. And then there's another kind of people who they, they acquire knowledge, they memorize the words, they speak it, nothing in the heart is affected. It doesn't get down to the heart. It's all just words because the, the, the intention in which they acquired it for is just to show off to other people, just to, to be known as someone who is learned. And that intention defeats their purpose and so they may have knowledge but that person actually could get punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they are not fulfilling the rights of knowledge that is due upon them and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to talk about one of the best ways of how you acquire knowledge and telling us that this is the path to Jannah and now he's going to talk about how do you get this kind of knowledge that no people gather together in one of the houses of Allah reciting the book of Allah studying it among themselves except tranquility descends upon them mercy envelops them and angels surround them and Allah makes mention of them among those who are with him subhanallah 
So here we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now telling us that the best way of seeking knowledge is to study the book of Allah, the Quran, studying the Quran. The Quran is a foundation of knowledge. And so whether you have one big circle and everyone is reciting it together or everyone is taking turns, but the idea is studying the Quran, studying the tafsir, studying the tajweed. You know, when you gather together, and he mentioned in the houses of Allah, in the masjid, you go to the masjid, you gather in the study circle, you know, and you begin to study the book of Allah together. Then four things happen to you. Number one, tranquility comes. You begin to feel less stressful as a result of that. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends tranquility, sakina. That the, in, the, in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find sakina, tranquility. Then mercy envelops them. You know, Allah's mercy comes over them. Then the angels visit and they come down. And this people that here, sitting there studying the book of Allah, the angels come. And listen. And then they go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and mention who is in that crowd, who is in that group. And Allah mentions your name to a group and a crowd better and greater than you and your people. So there is a great deal of, of reward in trying to acquire knowledge of the Quran, studying it as a group, you know, among themselves. That the, in implying that you should gather in, in teams and groups and study the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, we we know in so many ayats in the Quran that the Quran came as the ultimate guidance for humanity. In the hadha Quran yahdi lillati aqwam that this Quran, verily this Quran guides us to that which is upright and straight. And so the Muslim should always strive to be acquainted with his Quran. One of the tragedies that we have is that the shaitan have successfully been able to separate the Muslim from the Quran. This is one of the goals of the British actually, and the, the colonialists, when they went to the Muslim lands, they tried to find a way to separate. They recognized that the Muslims were attached to their Quran. And they say, if we can take these people away from their Quran, then we have a chance. They began to play with the language. And so today you find a lot of the people in the Arab world, they don't speak the language or the Arabic of the Quran. They speak a kind of a dialect. So they have successfully created a wedge between the language of the Quran and the language of the people. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the people used to speak and they understood the Qur'an. Today, if you go to the average Muslim in the Middle East, a lot of times they can't translate this ayah of the Qur'an because they don't use the same vocabulary, they don't use the same words. You know, the like Qur'an will say where means aina in the, in the dialect, they say wain. Now you can never, you see aina means where. And you are accustomed saying, Wayne, you know, there's no way you will be able to correlate. And so for a lot of times, the, even the, the, non, the, the Arabs themselves have a problem sometimes trying to understand what the Quran means. So they have successfully uh, created a wedge between us and our Quran. And there's so many Muslims who don't pick up this book every day. We only wait on Ramadan. And when Ramadan comes around, then we pick it up the book and and reading it every day and then when Ramadan finished on Eid day we just put it back on the shelf and we don't touch it again. The Quran came to be a daily guide for all of us as Muslims. And so in this hadith again the Prophet is emphasizing the importance of the Quran. So all of us who are listening to this make an intention to at least become familiar with your Quran. What an embarrassment it is. This is a miracle from Allah revealed to us in our grasp. Exactly how it was revealed to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
where Allah talks to us directly and you don't have time to listen. We don't have time to read about it. We're too busy doing what? What is more important than hearing every time you open the Quran is Allah, the creator of it all, talking to you directly, providing insight and giving you things that you will need to be successful in the dunya and the akhirah. Do not deprive yourself of this. And look what he does. He brings tranquility. He brings mercy. He brings angels when you do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to become attached to the Quran. We don't have to become scholars and hafiz. And, uh, not all of us will not be able to memorize the whole Quran. But we have to have a relationship where every day I'm reading a little bit, trying to understand a little bit. In our own time, the companions themselves, 10 ayahs they used to take. And until they learned that, memorize it, practice it, they didn't move on to another 10. They were not in the habit of just cramming and memorizing. They were more interested in understanding the guidance from these 10 and practice it and putting it in their lives. And then they move on to another. And so make it one of your, your, your habit. A lot of us, you know, we have schedules of, I got to watch this Netflix show. I have to watch this kind of movie. I have to watch this kind of sitcom. And religiously, when, if we are not there, we tape it and we make sure we don't miss a single episode. You know, Equalizer is coming on. This is coming on. You know, I got to be able to be there. And we have no time, very little time to put on the schedule for the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we ask, why is my life so messed up? Why is my life not going well? Why is there so many problems coming at me? It is because you have disconnected yourself from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance. And may Allah protect us from that. And then the hadith quotes which says, Woman abta'a bihi al amaluhu lam yusra bihi nasabu. And whoever is slowed down by his actions will not be hastened forward by his lineage. You know, there's this feeling among people of wealth and pomp and power and royalty that somehow their family connections, they see that helping them in this dunya and they somehow think that that will help them in the akhirah as well. You know, and the Prophet Sallallahu is making it very clear. The only thing that will help you in the akhirah is your actions. It don't matter if you are the son of Rasulullah Sallallahu As he mentioned when the people came and wanted them to be, wanted the Prophet Sallallahu to exempt the lady who stole. And he was saying, we will cut her hand. He mentioned that they were like, no, she's a very high status woman. You know, how can you do that, Rasulullah Sallallahu He said, in life, my own daughter Fatima stole. I would invent her. It is not an issue of your status and your pump and your position and your power. That might get you through in the dunya. But it will do nothing for you in the akhirah. What will be every single person has to strive individually. You know, all of us have to fast when it's time to fast. The rich, the poor, the pious, the, the king, the pauper, everyone. All of us have to pray five daily salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed it like that where you are not because of your lineage and because of this. You know, it is something that we have put on ourselves. And it is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put on the Prophet is making it very clear. Because it is deeds and our deeds. Some of us, we take so much pride. Well, I am the, the, the ancestor of this king and this one and that one and that one. That does not help you. What are you doing? Where are your actions? That is what is counted. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand this. And this hadith, as I said, it covers many, many things. But it's a beautiful hadith to remind all of us of our relationship with our brothers, our obligation to knowledge, our obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and our strivings towards him. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.